Good afternoon, and welcome to the Spring 2023 SWA Group Meeting General Plenary Session. I am so happy to be able to welcome you back to San Francisco, where we have not met face-to-face -face since the pre-COVID days of 2019. These are the speaker's disclosures for today's plenary session, and here is our agenda. I'm altering my customary plenary welcome sequence so I can lead with an election update. This evening, SWAG's Board of Governors will vote on new group leadership, specifically on whether or not SWAG will have its first ever joint group co-chairs. Most of you know by now that our nominating committee selected Drs. Don Hirschman and Prima Lara to be the two formal candidates the Board of Governors would consider at this group meeting. Drs. Lara and Hirschman then proposed something else, that the Board consider them jointly for potential election as equal co-chairs. Several of our NCTN sister groups use a shared leadership model, and last month our Board of Governors voted by well more than the two-thirds majority required to change our Constitution to allow this model in SWAG. It is now officially a new leadership option alongside the traditional single group chair choice. This evening, the board will hear from the two candidates and we'll have a chance to ask them questions directly. The governors then vote electronically. This time only, as we have only one potential pair, it's a simple up-down vote. On Monday, we'll count those votes and have our answer, which I'll announce to you in a special frontline edition. If our board of governors votes in Drs. Hirschman and Lara, they will serve as SWAG co-chairs elect for the next two years, leading the development of our next round of major grant applications. They will formally take office as group co-chairs when my current term ends in April of 2025. Before I move on to our farewells and welcomes, I want to thank our group chair and nominating committee, which was led by SWAG group statistician Dr. Michael LeBlanc, for their work identifying two outstanding candidates to put forward for consideration by our Board of Governors. On to our welcomes and farewells. We actually have two farewells today, and they are both particularly sad. Just yesterday, I learned that our community advocate representing older patients, Howard Krongard, died after a recurrence of prostate cancer. Mr. Krongard had an illustrious career in law that included several years serving as Inspector General of the U.S. State Department. A legendary lacrosse player, he was inducted into the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame and was twice named the outstanding post-college lacrosse player in the United States. As an advocate for patients with cancer, he helped define the then new role of community advocate for SWAG, and he also helped the Advocate Committee, committee identify outstanding candidates to fill our other new community advocate positions. Hildy Dillon, who is vice chair of SWAG's Patient Advocate Committee, said, we knew Howard in his last years as a passionate older adult cancer patient advocate, and we were lucky to have him ever so briefly as a member of SWAG's Patient Advocate Committee. He will be missed. His family is planning a memorial event for the fall, and details will be posted at the URL shown on the slide. In other tragic news, Dr. Roy Decker, chair of our Radiation Oncology Committee, died in February. His close friend and colleague, Dr. James Yu, now interim chair of that committee, was kind enough to write a moving tribute to Dr. Decker that I'd like to read. Roy Harold Decker, MD, PhD, our friend and colleague, former chair of the SWAG Radiation Oncology Committee, passed away on February 12, 2023, after a courageous battle with glioblastoma. He approached his diagnosis and treatment like he approached everything in life, with grace, intelligence, and good humor. He is survived by his three wonderful daughters, Faye, Bridget, and Julia, his four older sisters, and his loving wife, Elizabeth. Roy graduated college from the University of Virginia, where he met Elizabeth. He was an Eccles scholar there and studied Eastern philosophies and religions, starting its journey to become the world's most interesting radiation oncologist. He spent some time hiking the Pacific Northwest and being an award-winning sommelier. Roy obtained his MD and PhD from Virginia Commonwealth University and completed his radiation oncology residency at Yale. He rose through the ranks, eventually becoming the director of the clinical trials office at Yale Cancer Center and the program director and a professor of therapeutic radiology at the Yale School of Medicine. During his career, Roy pioneered the use of radiosurgery for lung cancer, and later with his colleagues in medical oncology, the combination of radiosurgery and immunotherapy at Yale. He was twice the Educator of the Year for the Radiation Oncology Residency Program. At his retirement Zoom held during this pandemic, dozens and dozens of his former mentees came together and showered him with love and affection and gratitude. Heard over and over and over again were the words, I ask myself, what would Roy do? 
And Roy, you taught me how to be a radiation oncologist in simple but always elegant, I love you, man. His passing leaves a giant hole in the radiation oncology world, and his voice will never be forgotten. Perhaps most important to Roy would have been being remembered as a loving husband and father. At his memorial held in March of this year, his family and friends told story after story of his kindness, laughter, and willingness to always be available and lend a helping hand. And that is the way we should remember him, standing by our side, picking out the wine, maybe making fun of us, providing us with wise counsel, and always leading the way. Thank you, Dr. Yu, for letting me share your incredibly moving tribute to Dr. Decker. We have just a single welcome today, but I anticipate two major ones in the next two weeks, so please stay tuned to Frontline. When Dr. Don Deason became SWAG's first vice chair for diversity, equity, inclusion, and professional integrity last year, he left large shoes to fill in the Digital Engagement Committee, where he had been the inaugural chair. Happily, we found an outstanding candidate for that position, Dr. Mark Lewis. Dr. Lewis was a prominent member of our original social media working group, predecessor to the Digital Engagement Committee. He also led our less than optimally successful experiment in using Facebook to form an online gathering space for SWAG members. But to be fair, that was my idea and not one from Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis is legendary on med Twitter, in part because he's done a masterful job of balancing the professional and the personal in establishing his, establishing his social media presence. As an oncologist who is also a patient with cancer, he has an incredibly comprehensive perspective, one that he sprinkles with wit, and as I just learned from attending digital engagement two days ago, a Scottish accent, when at all possible. His social media account collected three million impressions while he was under anesthesia. There's definitely something that Elon Musk could learn a thing or two from. In short, he's an ideal new chair for our digital engagement committee. Mark, welcome, or perhaps I should say, welcome back. In our new category of recognition, I want to acknowledge SWAG's membership programs manager, Connie Barnes. One week from today, Connie will mark 35 years with SWAG. In fact, she's been with us even longer than that, given her earlier stint as a temporary employee. Connie is our go-to expert for all questions about NCI and SWAG rules, regulations, and data sources as related to the roles of individual members and institutional membership. Given her mastery of SWAG in CTSU databases, it perhaps should not be surprising to learn she was also for many years the sole support person for information technology processes in our operations office. On a more personal note, lots of folks at SWAG know of her work supporting animal welfare, and the lucky among us, or perhaps unlucky, have gotten to enjoy her wicked sense of humor. Please join me in thanking Connie for 35 years and still going strong of service to our group and our patients. Thank you, Connie. The news is next, and there's quite a bit. SWAG's research results, and sometimes even just the trials themselves, continue to generate significant interest. The following list is by no means all of our important publications or presentations since our fall meeting, only the 10 for which we've issued press releases. Dr. Reshma Jagzi and work she presented at the ASTRO meeting found that rates of local regional recurrence among RX sponsored patients with HR positive HER2 negative breast cancer were low, regardless of whether or not they received regional node irradiation. Dr. Parminder Singh presented results from an interim toxicity assessment on North America's largest ever cancer trial testing bladder-preserving therapy, reported no safety concerns, meaning the S1806 study can continue to enroll patients. SWAG biostatistician Anna Mosley, PhD, reported at ASH the results of an analysis that found adding stratification factors to small trials designs can quickly reduce a study's statistical power. Among the 10 SWAG presentations at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, one that attracted particular attention was an analysis led by Dr. Yara Abdu of RX Bonder Breast Cancer Trial Results reported significantly worse clinical outcomes for non-Hispanic black participants versus Asians, non-Hispanic whites, or Hispanics. An analysis led by Dr. Joe Unger found that on the S1404 trial, patients with high-risk melanoma treated with pembrolizumab reported better quality of life than those treated with standard immunotherapy regimens. Other work led by Dr. Unger reported last year to much acclaim that 40 years of NCTN trials had added more than 14 million life years to patients with cancer. Dr. Unger's team published a refined analysis in December that put a price tag on those gains, 
Each added life year came at a cost of only 326 bucks of federal investment. I'm pleased that ASCO recommended the publication as a talking point with our senators and House representatives at their recent advocacy day in Washington, DC. And that one, I think, really deserves a hand for all of you. At the ASCO GI Symposium, Dr. Rakna Shroff reported S1815 study results showing that although adding nab paclitaxel to standard gemcitabine cisplatinum combinations for patients with biliary tract cancers did not extend their median overall survival, it did appear to offer a benefit to subset of patients who had locally advanced disease. The S1416 trial reported in Lancet Oncology by a team led by Dr. Priyanka Sharma recorded a benefit from viliparib in patients whose breast cancer lacked BRCA mutations but was considered BRCA-like, suggesting an even larger group of patients may benefit from PARP inhibitors. Our last two sets of results were presented at last month's AACR meeting. Dr. Carrie Kendra reported more results from S1512. 24 out of 27 patients with unresectable desmoplastic melanoma saw their cancer respond, partially or completely, to treatment with Pembro, an astonishing 89% response rate. Also at AACR, Dr. Young Quang Che reported on five cohorts of patients with rare gynecologic cancers from the S1609 DART trial, with three of those groups, including patients who had immunotherapy-induced remissions that now exceed three years. DART is a study that could not have been done in any other setting, and it's one of our studies that I am most proud of. While I can't report ASCO results yet, I can foreshadow a banner year, with SWAG contributing to 41 accepted abstracts, 30 of them SWAG-led, including five oral presentations. We also, I am so proud to announce, and for those who didn't notice, have a plenary presentation this year. Congratulations to Dr. Herrera and the Lymphoma Committee. Finally, we also had one trial launch that spawned quite a bit of coverage, some of it generated by a dedicated NCI press briefing. I refer, of course, to the S2302 Pragmatica Lung Study, now open at almost 200 sites nationwide and counting. Is your site on that list yet? Now, on to one of my favorite parts of plenary, where I get to congratulate and thank our highest accruing member institutions, the sites with the greatest number of SWAG credited registrations to SWAG managed trials in 2022. This year, to liven your plenary, I'm going to do it reminiscent of the Oscars. You know how, for the best picture, they always say both the movie name and then in a low dramatic voice, the producer's name. So, SWAG's highest accruing main members in LAPS in 2022 were University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, von Carlisle Morris, PI, City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center, Joni Mortimer, PI, the University of California Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center, David R. Gandera, PI, the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, San Antonio, Michael A. Liss, PI, and in a three-way tie for fifth place on this list, the University of Rochester, Paul Michael Barr, PI, the Moffitt Cancer Center, Nikhil Kushalani, PI, and my own institution, Oregon Health and Science University, Christopher W. Ryan, PI. Among our NCOR members, our highest accruers from 2022 were Heartland Cancer Research NCOR, Brian Fowler, PI, Kaiser Permanente NCOR, Jennifer Marie Suga, PI, Southeast Clinical Oncology Research Consortium NCOR, Judith Owens Hopkins, PI, Gulf South Minority Underserved NCOR, Scott Edward Delacroix, Jr., PI, and the University of Kansas Cancer Center, MCI, Rural MU NCOR, Priyanka Sharma, PI. Please, let's give all of these institutions a truly rousing, more than just polite, round of applause. Thank you. We continue our work to make SWAG and SWAG trials more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Our initiatives include an effort to more precisely answer the question, who are we? This is our membership profiles project, which will collect detailed data on the demographics of SWAG leadership and members. These data are key to being able to look at ourselves along multiple dimensions of diversity. After plenary, please take a moment to visit this URL or QR code, which you can also grab from a poster in the lobby. They will take you to a mock-up of the initial profile data collection screen where you can provide feedback on the range of data we hope to collect in phase one. 
At our fall group meeting, I welcomed Dr. Don Dizan as our new vice chair for DEII. Since then, he's worked closely with all involved parties to craft the landscape of DEII working groups diagrammed in this slide. Don emphasizes that this is just a starting point on our mission of achieving equity and reminds us that the goal is not to develop DEII in parallel, but to integrate it wholly into SWAG's mission to achieve better outcomes for all with cancer. I encourage you to visit swag.org slash DEI to learn more. I don't know where the last I went, but that's the website. I want to provide a brief update on the work of the SWAG Clinical Trials Partnership, or CTP. As you know, SWAG CTP is how SWAG partners with industry to conduct cancer clinical trials that are rigorous, scientifically relevant, designed and conducted using team science, that use dedicated CTP infrastructure, and which are 100% industry funded. These can be trials within the CTP Preferred Partnership Program, or just to make it more confusing, PPP, which are multi-arm and typically built on pipeline access, or trials initiated by SWAG committees, which can evolve into broader partnerships. The SWAG CTP Executive Review Committee peer review process now has approved four proposals for phase two trials that are nearing final contracting and protocol development. These broadly are a study in the first line muscle invasive bladder cancer space with multiple arms of neoadjuvant therapy that's defined by molecular subtype, a study in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer for patients with typical EGFR mutations who have detectable CT DNA after starting first line treatment, a study in metastatic head and neck cancer with patient cohorts defined by type of response to prior systemic therapies, and a study for patients newly diagnosed with Philadelphia chromosome positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL. The first of these trials is expected to reach activation near the end of this year. As those activations approach, approach we will email details to your site, and all SWOG member sites will be invited to participate in the feasibility assessments for these studies. For now, the SWAG CTP team remains hard at work behind the scenes, working on other trials earlier in development and on budgeting and contracting. On to the Hope Foundation for Cancer Research. This year marks Hope's 30th anniversary as SWAG's public charitable arm. Born in 1993 as the Southwest Oncology Group Foundation, Hope has now supported a full generation of research and researchers. In recognition of this milestone, Hope would, Hope would like your help in supporting the next generation. We're asking you to share the story of Hope's 30 years of impact in building on that story to ask three people you know to advance Hope's mission with a gift of their own. Hope's toolkit of key messages will help you in making your personal pitches. You can download it at the URL shown here or can pick up a print version from Hope's table in the lobby. We'll celebrate Hope's birthday at the fall group meeting until then, please help Hope to provide the next generation of impact. And speaking of impact, I'm happy to be able to announce our newest impact award. The award goes to Lisa Rimza, MD, of the Mayo Clinic, Arizona, to support the project prediction of early progression of disease in follicular lymphoma. Congratulations, Dr. Rimza. In January, we announced two new HOPE funds to support early stage investigators, the Nicholas Vogelzang GU Scholarship and the NCOR Early Stage Investigator Travel Funds Program. These are new, but they're already making a difference, and here are the names to prove it. These are the researchers who are at this SWAG meeting, hopefully in this room, because of new HOPE funding. To them, I say, welcome. In addition to these 10 attendees, 87 other SWAG members were also able to travel to this group meeting thanks to various HOPE Foundation funding programs. Deadlines for numerous other HOPE SWAG funding opportunities are coming up. These include the NCOR Pilot Grant Program due June 1st, the Impact Award and Seed Fund programs both due July 1st, and the Coltman Fellowship and the Career Engagement Award, both of which have had their deadlines extended to September 1st. Of course, you can learn all about HOPE opportunities on their website, thehopefoundation.org. Now, I'd like to make one last appeal from HOPE, this time for leadership. The foundation is looking for a few new members for its board of directors. To promote strength and inclusivity, they are encouraging all interested candidates to apply. If you or someone you know would be a great candidate, please visit the HOPE website and complete the nomination form. 
Okay, now we go global. The theme of today's general plenary session is global oncology research which transcends borders. We'll start with a presentation on transnational aspects of our group's own work in the context of the SWAG Latin America Initiative. The presenter is Dr. Mariana Chavez McGregor, SWAG Executive Officer for International Affairs and Associate Professor of Health, Re Health Services Research and Breast Medical Oncology at the MD Anderson, Anderson Cancer Center. She will present on the SLAI's progress in its directions for the future. Dr. Chavez McGregor, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. It is really a pleasure to be here. I want to start by thanking Dr. Blanke for wanting to highlight what we have been doing at the SWOG Latin American Initiative and really talk to you a little bit about what has been our history, where we are today, and particularly where we want to go tomorrow. So to start with, I really want to highlight why Latin America, why SWOG is investing time and effort in Latin America, and why should we? It's not only because in Latin America we're our neighbors, but it's mainly because Hispanics are the largest minority in the United States. We all know that the number of cancer cases among Hispanics is rising, and that overall the Hispanic population in the United States is increasing. So therefore, it's fundamental for us to include Hispanic patients in our clinical trials and, and study this patient population. In addition, we need to really emphasize that the Hispanic population is very diverse. So by including patients in Latin American Hispanics, we're enriching our clinical trial enrollment. Now, how all this started? Well, back in 2008, more like a short-term proof of principle, SWOG investigators developed a very important project trying to evaluate different strategies to eradicate H. pylori as a cause of gastric cancer. This was a very successful trial that accrued over 1,400 patients in two years. And then from there, it became a goal to really try to establish these lasting relationships between uh, SWOG and Latin American institutions. So all this really started and formalized in 2009 under the leadership of doctors um, Valdivieso, Crowley, and um, I'm Dr. Baker, and really different institutions started joining um, the Latin America Initiative. Dr. Pablo Dibieso was an executive officer, then Dr. Moore, who was the National uh, Cancer Institute Director in Mexico. And about a year and a half ago, I had the honor to join the team as an executive officer. A lot of things have happened in this last year, almost 15 years, and today we are very happy to have established very formal and fruitful relationships with a number of leaders in oncology and cancer institutions. The National Cancer Institute in Mexico joined in 2010, followed by the National Cancer Institute in Colombia in 2013. Also in 2013, the equivalent of National Cancer Institute in Peru joined, and more recently, we added three extraordinary institutions and organizations joining Chile, Uruguay, and Brazil, all of them in 2021. Now, as we try to integrate the sites into SWOG, we have had to learn that there's a lot of challenges in activating uh, clinical trials in Latin America and in occurring patients. We have done a lot of work trying to understand these challenges and, and see that there are challenges that relate to the Latin American sites, that relate to SWOG, that relate to the NCI, and they go anywhere from uh, State Department clearance to issues related to CTEP approval, to our own limitations with drug shipment to their limitations with shipment collection, shipment, and very importantly, it forces to understand the differences in standard care. Standard care, some things that are very you know, normal for us are not necessarily drugs that are available in some of our sites. And ultimately, there are multiple regulatory systems that are not necessarily compatible with US regulations. In many of these sites, it's normal and expected that all the care on their clinical trial is covered by the sponsor, which is something that clearly we are not used to doing in our SOC trials. 
Now, despite these challenges, the initiative has been very successful. And in this slide, I'm showing the um, accruing per year. And what you can see, there's been years, I want to highlight, of course, 2012 and 2021, where we've reached over 60 or even 80 uh, patients a year. Now, if we think about which trials are this, this slide will help you understand that in green is the Rx Ponder trial, and in um, lavender is the I Check It trial. So what we need to do is that despite these challenges, we need to try to identify the trials that are right for this site. Because unfortunately, not all our trials might be feasible to open in Latin America. Today, we're really proud to know and uh, announce to you that we have three active uh, trials in Latin America, with S2010 being ready to be hopefully open in about three or four of our sites. There are a number of other trials that are in process, and we're in communicating, um, actively communicating with sites, with the operations office, to try to make sure that this list increases year after year. Something that we have done is to try to facilitate, encourage committee participation of our Latin American investigators. There's a lot of talent in our colleagues, and we want them to be part of SWAT committees. Some of the other activities that historically we've engaged with relate to our educational mission within SWAT. And of course, we want to educate Spanish CRAs about our processes, and we believe in the importance of holding local training conferences. This has been taking place almost yearly, in person, virtual, hybrid this last year, when we were hosted by our Uriah colleagues, and really try to engage with the local investigators and with their rest of colleagues, trainees, and staff. We are also holding open a SWOG Latin American Symposium twice a year. We just had ours yesterday. I believe it was a clear success. We had a lot of engagement. Many of you were there. And we're trying to include more members of SWOG into learning about what we do. And that actually was the rationale that made us publish our newsletter we have published two issues. We're expecting to publish one after our symposium, and we're trying to use this not only as sending you more emails, as I know that we all have our full inboxes, but to really increase awareness about who we are, how we're doing things, and, and how you can join and, and, and help us and extend this important part of our work. So this is how we got here and what we're doing, but something that is clearly very important is to learn where are we going? And in order to further discuss this, we had an extraordinary meeting in January in Seattle where the SLI court uh, leadership, representatives from OPS, and of course, SWOG leadership, we got together to discuss what are we doing, what we want to do. And, and this is our mission, and we want to be clearly aligned with SWOG, but what we want is to improve the lives among Hispanic populations through supporting cancer clinical trials and translational research. Now, this is clearly a big statement, and it's, it, but it's our mission, and how are we going to get there? So, so we're trying to develop goals that you can help us achieve to really make this a reality. What we want is to support Latin American cancer researchers and research institutions in strengthening their institutional capacity so they can conduct high-quality cancer clinical trials. We need to improve the activation, we need to facilitate these processes, and eventually identify additional cancer institutions so they can join us. While we are not actively looking for additional institutions, this is something that clearly will help us grow and expand our reach within the region. We want to establish excellence in clinical research, including best practices in study design, data collection, and management in Latin America through an investment in clinical research. We believe that education is key for this, and part of the activities that align with this goal are continuing with our educational activities by virtual seminars or regular calls and our in-person or hybrid meeting that we're hoping to continue conducting collaboration with our sister institutions yearly. We have just announced that we're in very uh, final conversations with our colleagues in Colombia to try to see if we can host our next symposium with them in Bogota, their National Cancer Institute. 
We want to identify and support clinical research involving Latin America principal investigators and their patients. And to include principal investigators, we need to help train them. And we want to uh, make sure that they continue to be part of programs like the early investigator training program. We want to continue making them part of our working groups and committees. We want you to welcome them and exchange scientific and academic information with them. We want eventually to help also developing uh, proposals that are coming from Latin America because we want ultimately this to be a bi-directional interaction that is of course of um, reward for all of us. We want to increase the number of available protocols to Latin American side that are relevant to Hispanic communities, not only in Latin America, but ultimately here in the United States. Now, in order to increase the number of protocol available, protocols available to the Latin American side, there's a number of things that we all have to do. And it all starts by starting to think about Latin America as a potential site to activate your studies. And that may have implications at the time of study design, study development, protocol activation. So we want all of that to be part of our future. And maybe this idea of creating more pragmatic trials can really help to activate some of these trials down in Latin America. Because ultimately, what we want is to increase the number of protocols that we're activating and contribute to SWOG's mission. Ultimately, and as you can see, a lot of these goals are synergistic and overlap with each other, but what we want is to help reduce barriers to Latin America SWOG sites and also to underserved communities participating in SWOG protocols. And as I mentioned previously, this begins with concept and protocol development, and we really want to you know, explore solutions to legal financial barriers, things as simple as including um, in the budget money for translations, because something as simple as that can be a barrier to activate a study in our, one of our sites. Ultimately, we really want to work and collaborate with our colleague Don Deason and the DEMC to really find ways to synergize since there's a lot of um, um, activities that we, can, that we can collaborate together. So SWOG is clearly supporting the Latin America initiative and we exist for and because of SWOG. And SWOG is really supporting us and helping us through the ops office in trying to increase this number of protocols that are available. We're really brainstorming on a regular basis on ways to reduce barriers for activation and participation. We really want to thank SWOG for continuing to support the education, the career development opportunities for our uh, investigators and staff. For that, clearly the whole foundation has been critical and we continue to look a way to adapt our protocol so ultimately we can increase um, the number of the studies that we open. Now the same way that SWOG as an organization supports us, we also think that there are many ways that you can support the Latin America Initiative. And of course, as you think or design studies, think about us and think about us since early conception design. You can also help to be a mentor to some of our investigators that are new to the uh, cooperative systems that are new to SWOG, peer-to-peer -peer opportunities. Some of you have already volunteered for this and we're most thankful for that. Many of you have also helped us to provide feedback to local projects and to local investigators, continue clinical training, attending our symposium, reading our newsletter, and really just making our SWOG Latin American sites be and feel that we belong and we're part of SWOG. So in order to close, I just want to share some final thoughts with you. So clearly, the SWOG Latin America Initiative has activated more studies recently. We're starting to become more active, and we're very excited about this. We're very excited about the increasing committee membership and scientific contributions. We want to also thank you for welcome, welcoming our investigators to your committees and expect that this number will increase. We want to continue training local research teams in Spanish and continue to provide opportunities for early career investigators and engaging with all members of SWOG. So we all know, and that's why we're here, that cancer clinical trials improve care. And training of clinical investigators is crucial to provide modern therapies through our participation in clinical trials. 
it is clear that international clinical trials have many barriers. And many of them, I think, we can overcome. Some of them, we might not. But that doesn't mean that we cannot identify extraordinary studies to open in Latin America. Because I think it really, and I'm convinced, that Latin America has unique opportunities because there's a lot of talent, we have a lot of unique patients, and we can really ultimately contribute to fulfilling Swag's vision. So we are mostly thankful, and I personally am incredibly thankful to our uh, Latin American core team, particularly Deisha Kristen, who is an extraordinary um, person to really bring together SWOG and communicate and be the perfect link with our Latin American sites. And on behalf of us in the Latin American core team, I want to thank the SWOG leadership team, uh, our team maintaining operations, and of course the Hope Foundation because that's, that's how we exist. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about what we've been doing, and thank you so much for your support. Sadly, no lucrative product placement fees to disclose. All right, next up, we have a speaker with a long history and a good history with SWAG, Dr. Julie Grelo. Dr. Grelo is Chief Medical Officer and Executive Vice President for the American Society of Clinical Oncology. But of course, we made her famous. She had a long run as Breast Committee Vice Chair and served as one of my first and most valuable executive officers. Julie's work has long been international in scope. And today, she's sort of here to present on the topic of partnership and education as components of global oncology research. Ensuring our global oncology plenary is truly global, she should be joining us today from the WECAN Malawi Breast and Cervical Cancer Advocacy Summit. That conference is being held in Lalongwe, Malawi, where the time is nine hours ahead of San Francisco. So unfortunately for all you guys, I have to go off teleprompter, always a dangerous thing. She's having some Wi-Fi problems, but being smart and being Julie, she did record her talk in advance just in case. So we're going to give it a shot, and let's try and post her uh, presentation. Hello to all of my SWOG friends and colleagues, and thanks for the invitation to present in this plenary session on Global Oncology Research Transcending Borders. I'm going to speak today on partnership and education as part of global oncology research. Here are my disclosures. As many of you know, ASCO, despite having the A, American in the name, is very international. At our annual meeting, approximately 40% of our attendees are from outside of the US. And in our membership, a full third are international. We have more than 45,000 members in over 150 countries. Our global engagement spans our three mission pillars. First, research. We have international research courses and grants and awards, as well as JCO Global Oncology, which we created to publish global oncology research. In education, we have mentoring awards, we have other international courses and partnerships, we have international meetings, a global health track at our annual meeting and global webinars. And also in quality, quality care, we have international quality oncology practice initiative and certification quality training programs, resource stratified guidelines, and an international cancer core. With respect to global cancer research, we fund a lot of awards. We have global oncology young investigator awards that are specifically earmarked toward global oncology research. We have career development awards that uh, have been awarded to those from outside the US. We have an international innovation grant, a long-term international fellowship award, and an international women who conquer cancer mentorship award. We have a, a great program called IDEA, the International Development and Education Award. Uh, to qualify, you have to be from a low or lower middle income country. Um, and the recipients uh, have are paid for to come to the annual meeting. They're paired with a mentor. They get to go visit the mentors institution. Uh, in 2022, the IDEA program reached 20 years. And in that time, we funded 405 IDEA recipients from 70 countries. The important thing is these are early to middle career 
leaders in their countries. And we then use them, keep the mentorship going as a pool for our committees and other ASCO programs in their own countries. With respect to global education, uh, we do about 10 to 12 international courses on average per year, reaching over 1,000 clinicians trained through these programs. We have a multidisciplinary cancer management course, a course in tumor board development, palliative care. Uh, for primary care providers, we have a cancer prevention and screening course and an international research course. Um, almost 90% of our attendees report changes in practice one year later. In uh, partnership for doing virtual courses, we've partnered with something called Project Echo. This is a screenshot of a Project Echo uh, course in partnership with ASCO um, on uh, education in Nepal. And we have uh, global cancer quality care projects. We've converted our ASCO quality oncology practice initiative to something more applicable to low and middle income countries. And we're piloting that uh, to show th these countries, introduce them to quality measures, identify gaps, start the path toward quality improvement. And we're piloting this at four of our ASCO international cancer core sites. One of our strongest partners in this pilot is Dr. Jackson Oram, the director of the Uganda Cancer Institute. And when we started the LMIC COPE uh, pilot project in Uganda, uh, we worked with him to pick five core measures drawn from our standard COPE measures. Uh, he picked pathology report confirming malignancy in the chart, staging documented within one month of the first office visit, a documentation in the chart for planned chemotherapy, including doses, route, and time intervals, and then documentation of what was received with respect to chemotherapy, and then a measure on pain being assessed at least by the second office visit. Uh, what we found when we did the baseline assessment was there were a lot of gaps. Most of these things were nowhere to be found in the medical record. And what's relevant to this talk is you can't good do good clinical research if you don't have these things that are documented in the chart. Dr. Oram very appropriately brought his whole team together and said, hey, look, we can't even find a confirmation of cancer in a majority of these charts. And they've, worked, they've developed a path toward quality improvement to make sure that this occurs. And they're doing quite well, monitoring regularly, and they're ready to add a few more measures. Along those lines of partnering in quality care, just this past June at our ASCO annual meeting, we signed a memorandum of understanding along the lines of quality care with the World Health Organization. You may recall that Andre Elbaue, a surgical oncologist uh, who leads the cancer efforts at the WHO, was a speaker in our presidential symposium. So our initial projects with the WHO will pick WHO member states and cancer centers within them to improve access to quality care by linking facility level, level quality improvement activities with the country's national priorities and strategies. In order to better serve our members uh, that are outside of the US, we decided to convene regional councils. Uh, we started with Asia Pacific in 2019 added Latin America in 2021, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa started late 2022, and we are hoping to launch Central and Eastern Europe this year. It was planned to be launched last year uh, prior to the war in Ukraine, uh, and we're sorry that it's still on hold. The role of the regional councils is to advise ASCO on needs and challenges for the members in their region, to identify and adapt ASCO programs and services that can be used to address regional challenges, to identify opportunities and learnings that could be applied within the region, to serve as a forum, to network, collaborate, and develop local solutions together, and to raise awareness and increase engagement within their countries in ASCO opportunities. 
Asia Pacific Regional Council was started first, launched in May of 2019, so they've done the most so far. One of the first things they did was have a competition for a new international cancer course site, and Sarawak, Malaysia uh, was awarded this new ICC site. They immediately decided they wanted virtual, virtual training courses and palliative care to start, and they've started developing a quality improvement program. Another thing the regional council wanted early on was they said, I want, we want adaptation of the ASCO leadership development program for Asia Pacific. And so we've already completed our first round of the ASCO Asia Pacific LDP with 12 participants, and we're about to launch the second round. Uh, because COVID occurred shortly after this regional council was launched, we worked with them on COVID-19 webinars and help in dealing with the pandemic. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had had an ASCO Asia Pacific breakthrough meeting. This was something that the regional council wanted. The first one was in 2019 in Bangkok. The intention was to repeat this at two-year intervals. The pandemic got in the way, but we are all set to go in August of 2023 in Yokohama, Japan, in partnership with the Japanese Societies of Clinical and Medical Oncology with Breakthrough uh, in Yokohama. And relevant to this talk, we're preparing a JCO Global Oncology Special Series with the Asia Pacific Regional Council on Research in Asia. The Latin America Regional Council came in and said, we want help with clinical trials. And we have good training. We have sites that are quite capable of doing good quality clinical trials. We know that because of our SWAG Latin America initiative, but we don't get many opportunities. Industry doesn't come to us. We don't get a lot of chances to do our own research. So uh, through in partnership with Conquer Cancer, ASCO's foundation, we approached industry and we got funding for a pilot project in metastatic breast cancer. So the funding came from industry, Conquer Cancer did the grant management, but these funds were given to the regional council to develop their own request for proposals, to do their own promotion of this opportunity, and to do their own grant review and selection. Now, I'll tell you that within a week prior to the deadline, we had no completed applications, very few that had been started. We started panicking uh, and reached out to our, our Latin America colleagues, uh, including Mariana Chavez McGregor, who said, Julie, this is Latin America. You will get applications. They will come in at the last minute. So uh, needless to say, we got 61 applications uh, and we could only award six to seven. They came from 11 countries spread throughout Latin America and they selected the six to seven that will be awarded. Not sure they've been announced yet, but they will very soon. And now planning is underway to do a similar pilot in Asia Pacific and hopefully Sub-Saharan Africa. And speaking of Sub-Saharan Africa, in addition to having a regional council that was just launched in December there where a major focus is on partnership and clinical trials, uh, we also signed a memorandum of understanding with AORTIC, the African Organization on Research and Training in Cancer. Here's a fun satellite symposium we did at the AAADV meeting, the Accelerating Anti-Cancer Agent Development and Validation Workshop on Action for Increasing Diversity, Market Access, and Capacity in Oncology Registration Trials. Is Africa the answer? We did this session in partnership with Aortic and other partners and uh, have published it in JCO Global Oncology. So we hope for lots more opportunities with our aortic and our Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Council members uh, to enhance clinical research in Sub-Saharan Africa. Here's a fun partnership with the City Cancer Challenge. This was an initiative of the Uni Union for International Cancer Control. It's now its own nonprofit. Uh, but this was focused on improving cancer access, research, et cetera, at the city level with the commitment of the government and the local uh, healthcare providers and cancer clinics and all of the stakeholders at a city level. So ASCO's partnership with CCAN, the City Cancer Challenge, is in education and access to ASCO resources and programs. At this point, there have been 13 cities that have been selected in low and lower middle income countries to be part of CCAN. And uh, an initiative I really like and have been part of 
is the CCAN ASCO Leadership Program for Women in Oncology, which was launched this past fall at the UICC meeting in Geneva. So applicants came from each of these cities that are part of CCAN uh, to be part of a year-long leadership program for women in oncology. Here's a picture of the applicants uh, who were selected meeting for the first time uh, in Geneva at the UICC meeting. And another part of the ASCO CCAN uh, relationship is that we conduct multidisciplinary cancer management courses in these cities. Uh, this is one from Porto Alegre, Brazil, that I was invited to participate in. Uh, we bring together uh, the physicians, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we include nurses, we include pharmacists, we include patient advocates from the region. A fun part of this multidisciplinary cancer management course is that there's a session on how not to demonstrate uh, a, how not to run a tumor board. That's a picture in the upper right with the radiologist who's not paying attention, the pathologist who's not prepared, the over-aggressive surgeon who dominates the whole conversation. And actually the audience gets to vote on the winners of the best actors in this how not to run a tumor board uh, session. And uh, these are the winners uh, holding their cupcake awards uh, for being the best actors in that session. And the bottom right was an ancillary meeting that was held um, along with this uh, multidisciplinary cancer management course uh, with business and professional women in Porto Alegre. Uh, and we were uh, part of a program uh, that talked about how to grow leadership and support women in leadership positions. And on the far right of the picture on the bottom right is our CCAN. Leadership Program for Women in Oncology representative from Porto Alegre, uh, Fernanda. Additionally, um, ASCO is really happy to partner with the SWAG Latin America Initiative. We'd like to build a stronger partnership uh, where we'll get more synergy, more uh, benefit if we work together in our clinical trials workshop. So I was invited to participate in this SWAG Latin America Initiative workshop this past fall in Uruguay. And uh, you can see the audience and some of the faculty here. Uh, one of my talks was on the role of patient advocates in clinical research, why it's important uh, to have patient advocates involved uh, no matter where you're conducting research. And along those lines, patients as partners in improving cancer care and research is an important part of all we do. Uh, Eric Weiner is our ASCO president for 22-23. And he's picked a theme of partnering with patients, the cornerstone of cancer care and research. So ASCO believes in this patient partnership. And some of you know about my, my decades long uh, side project called WECAN, the Women's Empowerment Cancer Advocacy Network that started in the late 90s in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, uh, with this is a picture at the bottom of one of our recent 2017 We Can Breast and Cervical Cancer Patient Advocacy Summits in Kyiv. Um, up at the top, we were then invited uh, about 10 years ago to try a model of We Can with breast and cervical cancer patient advocates in East and Southern Africa. And this is a picture of our first We Can Africa Summit in Kampala, Uganda, about a decade ago. And that's why I can't be with you here today, because we finally were re re able to reschedule our seventh weekend Africa Breast and Cervical Cancer Advocacy Summit that had been planned for March of 2020, and it just overlaps with the SWAG meeting. I'm in Lilongwe, Malawi right now, um, and uh, a panel from just earlier this morning was all about opportunities for partnership and collaboration. We're talking to the patient advocates in breast and cervical cancer from the region. And in this morning session, we have representatives from the local Malawi women's cancer nonprofit, but we've got talks from the WHO, Aortic, um, the, the uh, International Cancer Institute in Kenya, from ASCO and from City Cancer Challenge. So we're empowering the patient advocates uh, to partner with us. So with that, I'll end, I'll say partnership and collaboration of the keys 
to ASCO's global strategy. I've talked about some of these relationships. We have a very important relationship on access to oncology medicines with UICC called the ADAM project that I could tell you about uh, if you're interested in. But partnership is key. Happy to partner with SWOG uh, in helping bring better research, better clinical trials, uh, no matter where we're conducting it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for this invitation to speak to you today. Hope to be in person with you next time. And Dr. Grelo hopefully will be joining us live for the uh, Q&A panel that's gonna follow our last speaker. So speaking of which, our next speaker is Dr. Ophira Ginsberg, a medical oncologist and global women's health researcher who is senior advisor for clinical research with the NCI Center for Global Health. Dr. Ginsburg was honored with ASCO's 2022 Humanitarian Award, and she co-chairs the Lancet Commission on Women and Cancer, which addresses questions at the intersection of social inequality, cancer risk and outcomes, and the status of women in society. Today, she joins us remotely to present on the topic of translating global health lessons learned in Africa to Latin America. Dr. Ginsburg, welcome. Thank you so much, and uh, tough acts to follow, I must say. I, I feel um, honored to be uh, in the presence of such amazing women, including, of course, <laughs> Dr. Grelo, who couldn't attend either in person. Um, I've changed the name of this talk, I'm being a bit sneaky here, and calling it Clinical Trials in Low and Middle Income Country, Global Health Lessons. And I'm saying this partly because I think we all need to be a bit um, realistic and also humble about what might be relevant in one region or country that you can actually directly translate to others. Africa, of course, being you know over 50 countries and Latin America also being multiple, multiple countries. Um, so without further ado, please uh, change the slide. I forgot I'm not gonna be doing these myself. Thanks, and next slide. Next slide, please, thanks. So a little introduction first on the Center for Global Health. We are, oh, sorry, no, one slide back, please, thanks. The Center for Global Health sits within the office of the director of the U.S. National Cancer Institute. And uh, I joined just over a year ago, and my director, Dr. Satish Gopal, sends his regards. Sorry, he can't be there as well. Um, our strategic plan, actually, I encourage people to take a look online and read about all of our activities, many of which are around partnerships and dissemination, which is highly relevant to the discussion that Dr. Grelo uh, just uh, conveyed so beautifully. But we're going to focus today on the um, uh, the one at the very bottom there, second to last, increased support for cancer clinical trials in LMIC. Next slide, please. This is a new area for us. Thanks. And I'm going to start um, with a reality check, I'm sorry to say, but I think it's important uh, given uh, the relevance to this discussion as it pertains not only to Latin America, but also to the reality of cancer health disparities with respect to participation in cl uh, clinical trials in the US and in other countries as well, and in the real impact of what we're trying to achieve by supporting clinical trials. So this is a slide courtesy of Dr. Andre Ilbawi, who you've just heard about. I had the pleasure of working with him when I was a medical officer at the World Health Organization. And he presented this at the ASCO meeting in the presidential in the opening session last year. You can see in the left panel from the year 2000 and to the right, sorry, the right side, 2020, that we're talking really about um, new products per year five to 10 products per year in the year 2000 when I was um, still training in medical oncology that goes up to 30 to 50 a year. And I guess I can't use my pointer here. Um, 30 to 50 a year, which is exciting, of course, and many of the important advances uh, that you all have been involved in and leading from SWAG um, have come from these efforts. However, when you look at the monthly price at $2,000 a month for those new drugs uh, that were approved in 2000, up to 20,000 per month in 2020, and the overall survival impact being still around three months in median and mean survival. Now we understand that there's more to the impact than, than overall survival, and I'm excited to hear more about how quality of life metrics, um, patient participation in leading the development of trials, um, among other uh, factors, the magnitude of benefit scale, et cetera, are really becoming more uh, in 
ingrained and more part of our DNA as we do trials and advance clinical research in all countries. But we still, I think it's important to take stock of what we can do and what's relevant for much of the world's population who need care. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly through a few studies. This one was um, Access to Cancer Medicines Deemed Essential by Oncologists, a survey of almost 1,000 oncologists in 82 countries. That was by some of our colleagues we work closely with, including Dr. Albawi, Dr. Elizabeth DeVries, Richard Sullivan at King's College, and Dr. Chris Booth, who's at Queen's University uh, Canada, one of my alma maters, leading an initiative now you'll soon hear about, and we'd love to engage you in, on bringing common sense back to oncology. Um, next slide, please. I just wanna say a few things about this study. We look, they looked at the 20 most frequently selected high priority cancer medicines. So oncologists in low and middle income countries and high income countries were asked, what are the top 10 cancer drugs in terms of public health impact in your setting? It was mostly medical oncologists who responded, not all, mostly working in the public sector, some private, et cetera, no, no time for detail here. But to say that we were pleased to see that 95% of those most impactful drugs that are in use by the oncologists currently in practice in 82 countries actually are, they map onto the WHO's essential medicines list. I don't know if everyone would be familiar with the EML, but it's actually a very important tool um, most recently now incorporating magnitude of benefit scales and other metrics, not cost, interestingly. So there are a number of drugs now off or uh, on patent that are part of the EML since 2015. The most recent one being, uh, I believe, 2019. Next slide, please. Thanks. And next slide again. To say that of the low and low income and lower middle income countries, you can see here on the left just some of the top medications being really, you know, the big ticket items we've had for so long in our armamentarium as clinicians, uh, which have been long since made generic. 36% of the oncologists in these countries said they were universally available. Uh, cisplatin, less than half, you know, less than half for cyclophosphamide, carbo, cytokine, paclitaxel, on and on. Next slide, please. Out-of-pocket expenditures also significant, a significant proportion in their practice. And finally, next slide, the risk of catastrophic expenditures also showing um, very high. And this is a measure that includes, that is defined by more than 40% of your uh, household income uh, that you know, would be going to food, for example. Um, is, uh, is the measure there. And you can see there's a very significant number. Next slide. I think I included one more from, no, not from middle income countries. I think it's relevant to the Latin American uh, participants here today to say that most of those drugs were deemed available uh, fewer, far fewer uh, caused uh, out of pocket expenditures to the extent that they were catastrophic but still a substantial proportion of the oncologists from all regions um, did talk about financial toxicity. Uh, finally, just in terms of the data, I wanted to quickly show you this important paper by Jennifer Miller and colleagues. This is not only cancer drugs, um, this is uh, all new drugs funded uh, that were funded by clinical trials funded by uh, companies. So this is not relevant to NCI funding, but it, it is important to look at uh, to give you a sense of what's really happening in terms of availability of newly approved drugs in the last uh, bunch of years. This only goes to 2014. Next slide, please. But you'll see an evaluation of drug trials in high, middle, and low income countries. About a quarter of these were cancer drugs. The next uh, biggest category were drugs for infectious diseases and neurology. And you can see the percentage of drugs approved for sale in all of the countries, there were 70 countries outside the US, countries that they tested participants in to gain FDA approval by income level. And overall, uh, the high income countries after five years, only about 25% um, of the uh, countries that were included, um, the participants taking part in these clinical trials actually had access. Uh, next slide, please. And I thought it was relevant also to show this by region. 
So it's a bit of a busy slide and without a pointer, I'll do my best here, but I encourage you to look at the paper. On the very bottom, you can see one to five years and the y-axis is the median percentage of countries in a region um, that had access uh, or that had approval at a country level for the new drugs. And you can see at the bottom, unfortunately, um, African countries are represented by the black square and there really isn't much available even after five years. The next from that is the Middle East and the third from the bottom, the orange circle is Latin America which is a little bit below the uh, percentage of countries with availability uh, at each time point uh, represented in um, Asian countries. At the top is Canada, where I'm originally from, and Western Europe, which is pretty close to the US for approvals. Not completely, I mean, and it's dependent on other factors, as you all know well. So yeah, I think this is an important just to sort of frame what we're talking about when we're thinking about the importance of clinical trials in terms of access. This is just about approval, this particular study, but the previous uh, slides, I hope, give you a sense of uh, what we're up against in terms of the on the ground uh, situation. Next slide, please. Thanks. So on a bright note, okay, it's not all doom and gloom. There are incredibly important advances happening that are making real uh, inroads into cancer care and control. We've already heard about some of these today um, from uh, our previous speakers, including the opportunities, tremendous opportunities to advance capacity in terms of research training. Now that's not only for the clinicians and the clinicians aren't just physicians, by the way, of course, the nurses have a hugely important role to play, the pharmacists, and let's not forget all, besides the research um, associates, uh, but also the pathologists, which we often fail to mention is the rate limiting step in terms of being able to provide quality cancer care in many settings, right? If you don't have enough pathologists to provide uh, timely and quality diagnostics for uh, accurate uh, cancer diagnoses, even just with histopathology, let alone molecular subtypes, et cetera, and appropriate staging information that you all know what that requires, then we're not going to get very far in terms of uh, clinical research, including clinical trials. But that is shifting. And I'll draw your attention not to the commission that was mentioned at the beginning, although I, I'm, I'll be delighted to talk about that another time, the Lancet Commission on Women and cancer um, we're going to be launching in September. This was a commission I'm not involved in uh, on cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa and a uh, number of uh, familiar names to you, I hope are there, including James Olaro from NCI Center for Global Health, Dr. Otis Brawley and some of the other <clears throat> people who you might know, Tim Revick, et cetera. Uh, the next slide, I just wanna say I borrowed these from Dr. Pat Lair who couldn't be here today. Um, and he uh, contributed some thoughts to this presentation as well. Next slide, thanks. So, and next slide again. There are some recommendations to come out of this commission. For those who don't know, Lancet and Lancet Oncology um, invite people uh, like myself sometimes to coordinate uh, a group of experts, a very interdisciplinary group to uh, look at and set the priorities for um, research in a very challenging problem. And uh, we usually take about three years to come up with a set of recommendations. And then we want to make those actionable, of course. In the case of this commission on cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa, they were kind of, I want to say, not obvious recommendations. They are and they aren't. You know, It's easy to say it, it's harder to do it. But they really built a beautiful set of data and, and present this in a, in a cohesive way. I encourage people to look at this, look at the recommendations. The ones relevant today, our equitable collaborative research, right? We do this a lot in our Lancet Commission on Women and Cancer. In the face of power imbalance, right? We, we're thinking about here in this room at the SWOG meeting, how to improve equity, diversity, and inclusion in clinical trials in the US and, and everywhere, right, where we work. There also is the issue of how much power people really have to make these decisions. First of all, to access clinical trials, right? It may be the only opportunity in many settings to get a drug even in the control arm. That's something that we would take for granted in the US, but really is something uh, important 
in many lower and low income and some middle income countries, uh, as, as folks will tell you. The next in that list is to decolonize research. And I would encourage a discussion, if it hasn't already happened at the SWAB meeting, on decolonization, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, but everywhere where those of us from high income countries are working. So we need to think about equity and authorship in setting priorities for research that is relevant to your own setting, to their own setting, and to really lead the, provide the thought leadership, which of course requires uh, training as well as protective time, right? To even conduct, um, even attend meetings to be able to do the trainings in order to participate or conduct and lead clinical trials and to consider the entire research ecosystem and the local health ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. I'm quickly gonna go through, just advance the next slide again and again and again, please. This is board from uh, our director, Dr. Satish Gopal. Again, please just scroll through these slides. Do uh, Pat Lair uh, sent this to me. The treatment of advanced AIDS-associated Kaposi sarcoma in resource-limited settings, three-arm, open-label, randomized, non-inferiority trial. These are the key things, I love this slide, to give us a sense of what is important um, in terms of not just uh, the obvious relevance to patients that are more likely than they are in the US to develop a certain type of cancer, here it's AIDS-associated Kaposi sarcoma, but also to remind us of what's important in developing and conducting uh, relevant trials in any setting, single primary endpoint, simplified toxicity reporting, uh, collaboration, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just gonna wrap up in a moment to say a couple of words that then maybe we'll have time in the Q&A. At the Center for Global Health, we are just starting to undertake a program of work in clinical trials capacity building, and we hope to collaborate with all of you, um, including, of course, uh, ASCO, ESMO, all of the major cancer societies, AORTIC, and the other representatives um, on uh, regional councils, as uh, Dr. Grelo was mentioning, uh, international affairs committees of various organizations, and we've conducted so far key informant interviews that uh, gave us a sense of what the prim primary challenges are. We've also uh, conducted a request for information. We've gathered information on, uh, from other folks who, who contributed their ideas, and we're going to be launching a global survey. So stay tuned for more about that. This just last slide is just to show you challenges, and next slide are the strategies or potential solutions and don't have time to look at this really, but to say that uh, Dr. Lair, as his uh, previous uh, leadership role in the NCI CTAC, which is the uh, external <clears throat> advisory committee, they're taking a deep dive, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, into trying to streamline and simplify, and again, bring common sense to clinical trial design of relevance everywhere. So I hope this has been uh, useful. <laughs> I know I covered a lot, of, a, a lot of ground and I look forward to the Q&A. Thanks very much. All right, so our final speaker today has traveled the furthest physically to join us. Dr. Angelica Noguera Rodriguez is a medical oncologist specializing in gynecologic cancers who is professor and researcher at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. She's also chair of gynecologic oncology for the Latin America Cooperative Oncology Group, and she's on the board of directors of the Brazilian Society of Clinical Oncology. So we'll be presenting today on the topic of enhancing diversity through international research. Dr. Diguera Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Blank. Thank you, Suog, for inviting me and for, and for including this very important discussion, enhancing diversity through international research. And these are my potential conflicts of interest. As of 2023, the globe has reached over 8 billion people, 60% of us living in Asia, combining China and India, over 3 billion people. And if we, in regarding the shares of the world population in the last 2,000 years, Asia is now 60% of the share, but it used to be 75% 2,000 years ago. Europe is stable, around 15%, and America has increased from only 3% 
to almost 15% nowadays. And another relevant information for our discussion today regarding population distribution is that 84% of the global population currently live in low and middle income areas, while only 16% live in high income countries. So if the global citizen were one person, it would be Asian, either male or female, because half of the population currently are male and half are female, and would live in a low, low and middle income country. Changing gears to the cancer global burden, according to the global CAN projections, uh, the number of cancers will double in 20 years, from approximately 20 million to almost 40 million in 2040. Uh, the, non the mortality will also significantly increase from almost 10 million to 16 million. But if we calculate mortality to incidence ratio, it will diminish from 0.5 to 0.5. Four, four, so a, a decrease in 10%. But this is not the reality, sorry. This is not the reality for the African continent, for example. Incidence and mortality are going to numerically increase, but the mortality to incidence ratio will also increase in Africa from 0.64 to 0.68. And we don't need to go that far. If we look for our neighbors in my region, Latin America and the Caribbean, according to the global camp projections, mortality to incidence will also increase in 20 years in Latin America from 0.48 to 0.52. So probably global can is telling us that despite all the evolution in prevention and treatment of cancer, we from Latin America will not have access to these strategies. But we are here today to discuss disparities in clinical cancer research. Uh, and these are, these are American numbers, but over 50% of participants in clinical trials live in this country. But the numbers are not good. Less than 10% of the adults with cancer in the United States take part in clinical trials nowadays. And around 5% are black and 5% are Hispanic despite the fact that 15% of cancer patients in the US are black and 13% are Hispanic. And the female participation is also below the desired less than 40% of the participants. Currently, participants in clinical trials are younger, healthier, less racially, ethnically, and geographically diverse than patients in clinical practice. Probably this is one of the biggest, the biggest trials uh, focusing on uh, the distribution of clinical trials globally. It was published five years ago at PLUS One. Uh, and as you can see, most trials are conducted in the United States. And uh, this trial, th this study includes over 89,000 trials and 83% of the trials have been conducted in high income countries the US or, or other high income areas, and less than 5% of the trials have been conducted in the low income and lower middle income tiers. And this is not restricted to diseases that are common in high income countries, just like breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, but also cervical cancer. If you see the blue map, uh, cervical cancer trials are five times higher in the, uh, in the United States than in Latin America. And if you look at Africa, where cervical cancer keeps on, keeps on being a leading cause of cancer death and, and a leader cause of cancer in women and, and death in women, there are, the, the numbers are absent. There are no clinical trials. And if the clinical cancer participant were one person nowadays, it would be a male Caucasian and living in a high income country, a completely different picture of the global citizen nowadays. Real world challenge to develop clinical trials in low and middle income countries are multiple, you know it very well. We can group them. There are limited infrastructure and resources, regulatory challenges, and here I'd like to highlight time to approval of the trials in Latin America, social cultural factors, 
mainly because of low awareness of clinical trials, difficult to access funding, and difficult to, to start and to maintain collaboration and capacity building. But there, there are several advantages of performing trials in low and middle income countries besides increasing diversity which is necessary to ensure efficacy and safety of the drugs in different populations. Patient availability, faster accrual, patients enrolled in developing countries usually are treatment naive and less and have and they have less or no competing trials as alternative and no state of the art um, sometimes and costs are lower but as you can see new opportunities are arising and there is an increase in clinical trials availability one percent increase in the low income tier 20 percent increase in the middle income tier combining lower middle and upper middle, and a small decrease in the United States, 0.5, if we consider the, the time frame from 2006 to 2012. And if you allow me to bring some Brazilian and Latin American data, uh, and Dr. Mariana has helped me a lot with that, not, not only because we are neighbors, because, that, because there are significant opportunities to partner with the US. In Brazil, research activities are still limited, few investigators, few academic center, centers, but it's improving. Now Brazil is one of the 25 countries with the greatest development of clinical trials is sponsored by by pharmaceutical companies due to its recruitment capacity, trained professionals, adaptations of its technology parks, and local regulations for the protection of human beings. Currently, Brazil has 1,300 open cancer studies in Brazil, most phase three and four, but some phase one and two trials uh, in cancer research. In, the, in recent years, several independent research groups have been created in Latin America. And for 15 years now, we have LACOG, the first multinational cooperative group in Latin America, exclusively dedicated to clinical and translational cancer research. LACOG has now over 400 research members in four, 14 countries in the region, and the group has published several papers, and it has several ongoing studies. Regarding these independent research groups, one example is the Brazilian Gynecology Oncology Group, recently partnering with NGOT, GOG, and GCIG, and I hope we can partner with SWOG soon as well. So we all know this, that there are several barriers to implement clinical trials in low and middle income countries, uh, and we need to act. Uh, and we need investment in uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but not only funding, financial funding. We need equity-focused design in clinical trials. We need to focus on education and training, cross-cultural education for researchers from, from high-income countries, and basic mentoring and, and, and basic training for researchers from low and middle income countries. And we need concerted committed, commitment across research stakeholders. So ASCO has defined that everyone with cancer diagnosed should have the opportunity to participate in clinical trials as it's a surrogate of high quality care and when you SWOG members try to foster international collaboration, you are also fostering high quality care in low and middle income areas. So, and it tends to improve equity. Thank you for opening to this possibility. Thank you for your time and attention. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Negara Rodriguez. We're actually gonna give you, the audience, a chance to address your own questions to the, today's presenters. We'll have you step up to the microphones and I'm gonna sneak back to the uh, table so we can enter questions via chat. We have one additional expert joining us to field those questions. Dr. Paul Perlman is a program director with the NCI Center for Global Health and is leading the center's efforts in global health technology. So thank you for making your expertise available to us. Please step up if you guys have any questions. And Lee was right about the lights. I can't see anything. See me? Nope. Me. Oh, perfect. 
I think it's Dr. Hirschman. Can't yeah. It, yes, Don Hirschman. So, you know, one of the issues that comes up with a lot of the trials is really just getting the drug to the patient. And it seems like a solvable problem, right? There are so many things out there that are so challenging to solve, but that seems like something we should be able to solve. And so I guess the question to the whole group, the whole panel is, how can we solve that problem? Um, because there's so many of our trials that I think we would be able to open easily if we could get both the drugs for the intervention and the control uh, to those patients. Well, I, I can go first. Thanks, Don, for your question. I, I think you're absolutely right, and we need to try to get these drugs um, down there. And clearly, uh, our colleagues in the pharma industry can do it, so we should be able to do the same. I think there are issues with, with regulation, of course, with cost, that if we could um, solve that can make it uh, easier. We do have issues related to who holds the IND of the drug, uh, but I think it's something that, as as you know, discussing the goals that we have, it's it's something that that we really want to tackle. You know, in the next in in the next couple of years to hopefully make it a reality. Okay, go. Anthony Elias, uh, Colorado. <clears throat> I had the uh, privilege of being an IDEA mentor for a number of years and uh, discovered, in fact, that the lack of access to standard of care um, really influences survival as an endpoint in clinical trials. Not so much progression-free survival or short-term, uh, but survival is affected. There are a number of uh, metastatic breast cancer trials where clearly where the patient population uh, was accrued from mattered. And, you know, I know that, um, you know, pharma companies now stratified by area of the world, but they're not stratifying by socioeconomic and uh, regular care access. And I can, I can take a stab at starting that. Um, I don't think a lot of low or lower middle income countries are part of these industry trials. So when you say they're not stratifying by the income level of the country, you know, you've either got upper middle or high income countries. Uh, and even with that, Brazil's an example. I think, you know, a lot of trials done in Ukraine, in Russia, um, they also get the standard of care arm if it's a randomized trial with a new drug. Um, they demand that it be provided, a, you know, the country does. And so you get the key drugs, but there's the whole infrastructure of what supportive care drugs do they have that they're not getting and, and, and other pieces that go along with it. So I'm not quite sure, Anthony, if I'm, uh, I'm helping to address this, it is uh, very clear that there is a, a big difference between the kinds of clinical trials uh, that can be done for the reasons you suggest that it's, it's not just the drugs that are the key randomization, if you will, if it's a phase three trial, but it's everything else that surrounds it that will it, impact. The, yes, outcome. I'm actually referring to subsequent care. So, for example, in ah, a couple of randomized trials in yep. breast cancer, for example, with capecitabine and gemcitabine that got the drugs approved in the United States had a very substantial amount of patients accrued from Eastern Europe, for example. And in, if you look at the single agent arm, only 60% of patients ever got subsequent treatment. And that's because they didn't, they had to pay out of pocket for anything beyond first line. So yes, they got the therapy in the trial, but they didn't get anything further. And that's clearly not what we would expect in the United States, for example. And, and not necessarily applicable to outcomes in the United States, as you point out. 
No, uh, Anthony, you're you're absolutely right. And something that I would like to to add, it may seem obvious, but I think it needs to be stated, is that when we think about drug availability for standard care, specifically in Latin America, but I think clearly applies to other uh, countries, is this is not homogeneous. So I can speak very clearly about Mexico. The, it's the country where I'm from, and there's a big difference of what patients have access in the public sector to all the drugs that have access, my colleagues that that private that work at private organizations. So even when we think about drug availability and these issues, as you point out, they're hard to study because we don't know exactly in what setting they are. Like in a way, maybe it reflects a lot of what really also happens in the United States that that not everything, it's, you know, top institutions and access to everything. So, so clearly important issue of, of access and heterogeneity at each side. Dr. Ginsburg, did you have a comment or response? Yeah, just a quick thing to note. Um, I really appreciate that point because uh, there'll be a study coming out soon that looks at country representation uh, of uh, phase three clinical trials over, I can't recall now, the last 10 years or something. And the lack of reporting is actually really notable. And so when I mentioned this common sense oncology sort of initiative that's starting that I hope to share more about this soon and engage, uh, engage folks in it, it includes how we um, deal with the, on the editorial side for reporting even in manuscripts, right? Think about the consort diagram and what else might be added to that to be another lever to ensure equity I don't mean that we're going to have equitable access because of the reporting at the end of the day, just because of that. But it's one of the sort of tools we might be able to use. So if, if uh, authors don't have to report on the countries in which uh, which contributed participants 100% um, of the time, that's problematic. Thanks. That might be Dr. Crowley. Dr. Blanke, thank you so much for putting this together, and thanks to all the speakers for a great session. Uh, I have a question for whomever dares uh, address it. We heard about uh, Pragmatica Lung, a large, simple trial described as real world, and yet, as far as I know, it's restricted to U.S. participation. I think our Latin American sites would love to join that trial, so any comments? Mariana, do you want to field this one? Well, I, I, I don't have the answer for that. I actually share the um, interest to have a study like Pragmatica open in Latin America. And, and we've, we've explored and, and bring this up to a number of people. And, and he believes that this is um, in the hands of, of, of the NCI. So I, I, I think the message will be that these trials are perfect. And they will actually, to your point, Angelica, if we are able to open them in other countries, we will have a real world pragmatic study. Yeah. Is there any NCI comments? Uh, I can't speak to that particular trial and I'm too new in the institution, but I can just say that the idea of real, well, the phrase real world also has, has a certain meaning, <laughs> right? Um, if you are going to enroll a handful of patient participants in many countries and say that you're, you know, conforming to what is expected in terms of diversity and of different populations in terms of ethnicity, even for the biological and socio-ecological reasons, you'd have to have a whole lot more patients in, this country in order to make some group analyses relevant, right? So I think we just have to be a bit realistic and clear about what we're trying to achieve by, by uh, trying to extend certain trials in particular countries. Yeah, we may have to rethink that label like the Super Bowl, the world championship played in the U.S. But uh, if, if I may, never like that. <laughs> if I may add, I think that really speaks to the importance of this type of sessions, right? To really hear and make you all part of this and maybe by us continuing to bring it up like a SWOG and NCI, et cetera, et cetera, then we can really start to think globally and, 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 and eventually make it happen. Great. Thank you, uh, Barbara Segarra, patient advocate, and thank you all for great presentations. And especially I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Grelo for bringing up the importance of having patient advocates. And as we think globally, 
Um, and uh, Dacia and Mariana know that I'm insisting about this. Um, as a Latina, even in the States, I'm kind of one of the few, right? So I think we have to, uh, as we think globally and develop all these clinical trials, include the patients from day one. And we have done this for a while here in the States, so we're willing to help and develop this in different countries. Thank you. Dr. Design, you get our last question. Sure. Um, thank you very much for this. And it's nice to see everybody online as well. So I th I'm going to challenge this group of leaders because you have so much experience in the internet, international arena. It's come to my awareness that things that we track for equity purposes to ensure equal access across populations in the United States, a large component of that is a collection of racial data. But that is not a transportable concept. That is not a transportable construct to other countries. So it seems to me one of our barriers when we look at equitable access on a clinical trial is what is the metric that is a universal standard that will define equity? Anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not sure how to respond. Oh, Go ahead. Um, you are 100% right. We have major efforts in an upcoming meeting in Chicago at the ASP annual meeting, even with just uh, the European Cancer Organization, on how do we even talk about equity between Western Europe and the U.S., because it's quite different and we're trying to get some terms down. Maybe you should join us at that. Um, I, you know, I was recently in uh, Mexico City for a meeting of a Lancet Commission on Health Systems and Cancer and asked one of their former ministers of health, uh, you know, what do you think about, you know, diversity equity in Mexico? And he said, oh, for us, like, Hispanic Latinx, we're all Hispanic Latinx. He said, it's the indigenous population, which is 20 to 30% of our population, and they are the poorest. So that would be who we would target. So I think maybe it's not each country's different, but each region's different in terms of across the, the racial and ethnic diversity. But then we've got all of our other social determinants of health that we've got to account for. And maybe those transcend borders a little bit better? I don't, I don't know, Ophira, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I was gonna say the exact same thing. So there are some countries where in fact, you're not allowed to ask about racial or ethnic identity. Um, uh, being Canadian and growing up in that system, that could hamper our ability to know where the uh, differences are. But nonetheless, there is a lot of emerging work, uh, particularly across in countries in social inequalities and cancer outcomes that's being led by our colleagues at IR, WHO's Cancer Agency. I suspect that that's a way to, that's probably a broader and important way, a take home method maybe for us in the US, think about just trans, transporting those metrics may not be relevant, but let's see what our metrics are. In some countries, it may be indigeneity. In addition to, by the way, you know, we haven't talked about gender, right? Gender disparities in access to trials and institution of care and all kinds of other things uh, we can talk about. Um, rurality, right? Whether you're living rural or urban. And then the obvious uh, socioeconomic one. These things can intersect, right? Intersectionality is important as well. It might be worthwhile having that conversation at some point. I would like to add that you clearly hit on a very important issue. We've been working on that with our sites because Hispanics, we are a mixed bag, right? And and how we can really try to understand that diversity better, it brings issues of um, equity and access. Many of these populations may not actually even speak Spanish. So how do you recruit those patients? So, so I think there's there's a, a lot of work that, that we can do and, and therefore our goal and you being part of, of you know, some of our, you know, common activities to really try to to make this within at least our countries. For example, I'm sure Angelica can talk to Brazil. Like, there's a very large black population in Brazil that we don't have in Mexico or Uruguay doesn't have. So, so we cannot put all of us in the same bag. Yeah, 
Yes, Brazil, Latin America um, is a heterogeneous country, a heterogeneous region. But if we want to start a collaboration with the region, we can establish pilots, starting with the institutions which are well prepared, and there are very well prepared institutions and researchers, and then we create a program to, to start training more institutions and doctors. So, we should start with those who are, which are more prepared and considering that it's heterogeneous and there are, uh, there are institutions in different levels and we can show us the, the diversity of our region. Thanks, and we can certainly squeeze in one final, final question. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great discussion. One topic that did not come up are barriers around tissue banking and access for translational medicine studies, because I think we will never fully understand diversity if we don't have the opportunity to look at the molecular parameters of tumors in different patients and the microenvironment. So I wonder if one or more of you could address how we can break down regional and country specific barriers in that area. Thank you. I think that probably accounts for about 90% of Dr. Chavez McGregor's effort, but please comment. Yeah, happy happy to add to that. Um, you're absolutely right. We, we need to bring those samples, and we appreciate the flexibility of some investigators trying to, you know, make modifications to the requirements. And I think what we're trying to understand is each country has different regulations and also different capacity. Um, so we're learning, for example, that um, shipping uh, frozen tissue, it's incredibly challenging. We have you know, hundreds of samples that have been waiting in Mexico for specific approval because the type of tissue that it is. It also depends on what type of testing it's going to be done, if there's going to be germinal testing or not. Um, so I think something that could be very important for us to keep exploring is what are the easier type of samples for each country to be able to ship. Have you as investigators tell us, you know, what what real flexibility you have for the time, and very importantly, maybe incorporate additional costs um, to the budget for these countries to be able to ship the, the samples, because it's not that easy, right? Sometimes in order to save um, money, they have to wait and batch them, and then that misses the, the timeline. So. I think there are ways that we can work uh, to, to decrease those barriers. So thank you for asking that. I'm actually gonna ask my colleague, Paul Perlman, if he has any comments from the NCI perspective in this regard, thanks. I mean, at, at the risk of opening a massive can of worms, I think that my perspective on this and increasingly as we're starting to look at the kind of work that we've been funding over the years is, is looking at those power dynamics and thinking about, well, do we need to ship all the samples? Can we build local capacity? Can we build funds into our grants to allow for analysis at the, at the point of collection? Um, and while that's not possible everywhere, certainly we can do more than we have in the past. Okay, well, I'm gonna offer one final thank you to all of our speakers, Drs. Mariana Chavez McGregor, Julie Graylo, Ophira Ginsburg, and Helica Nogueira Rodriguez, and of course, Dr. Paul Perlman. Julie, get some sleep. Yeah. All right, so we are coming to a close, but it may not surprise you, our global theme reminds me of an amusing story. It seems that four international travelers were walking down the street together in London, England, when suddenly a reporter comes running up and says, excuse me, esteemed visitors, what's your opinion about the gasoline shortage? Well, the traveler from a very wealthy country says, excuse me, what's a shortage? The traveler from a really green-thinking, socially conscious country says, excuse me, what's gasoline? And the traveler from a sadly very autocratic country says, excuse me, what's an opinion? But the traveler from New York says, excuse me, what's excuse me? <laughs> all right, it was worth a shot. This will bring our general plenary session to a close. I want to thank all of you for attending. I hope the rest of your meeting in San Francisco is productive, educational, and of course, exhilarating. Thank you.